another intellectually stimulating episode of Real True Facts. My name is Laura Palmer. And I am Willie Burroughs. Not that one. Not that one. Uh, Today our show is about the Goat Man. Uh, Who or what is the Goat Man? I I feel like it's one of the lesser known cryptids. Uh, I thought it'd be really cool to do a show about uh, more of a a regional cryptid um, because a lot of locals have their own version of the mothman like the mothman was found in west virginia jersey devils obviously in jersey uh but there are smaller ones that are no less terrifying but maybe the regular person doesn't know a ton about yeah a lot of the times that we do the cryptids um it's from you know ten thousand feet uh it's way way up um not literally but from you know it's an, a big overview and uh what's cool about the goat man in this in this case is that you know we're going from the a, a dramatic overhead view to right down in the dirt you know in the woods uh getting some details and uh taking a you know a look so to speak and that 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 excites me you know i'm not talking about just oh well it's um here's a general overview we can uh, really get down to the nitty-gritty that's what uh, interests me personally about uh the goat man this week i agree with you this is a very in-depth look at a cryptid that maybe not a lot of people know about and there are multiple versions of the goat man there is one in kentucky maryland and texas um they're very similar but they they do different things and our guest today knows a ton about the goat man uh he um made a uh, short horror film about it. We're going to talk to him later in the show, but he is our definitive source on the goat man. And he'll talk all about his uh, process making this movie because it is based on witness accounts. So we do have that proof that the goat man exists. And we, and we do talk a lot about Hollywood and what filmmakers, creators get right and wrong. And today we'll actually be able to talk to a filmmaker that, that got it right. Um, so I'm very excited about that. But uh, did you see a picture of the goat man? Did you, like, did you see what he actually looks like? I, you know, when it comes to research, um, in this case and in many cases, no, I guess yeah. the answer, no. <laughs> the answer is, yeah, is no. Um, yeah, I did not. And I'm not sure. I left this one a little bit open to mystery, to be perfectly honest. Uh, not unlike uh, Secret Biomes last mm-hmm. week and um, probably some of the other ones before it, um, you know, leaving it uh, as at a bit of a mystery to myself as well. Yeah, I think that's a great way to go into it just because we have so many different versions of the goat man and there are different accounts of what this thing has done. There are instances where it is more goat than man or more man than goat. And we're going to figure out today what exactly this thing is. Um, I did look at the photo and I wish I hadn't. Uh, I'm going to warn our listeners today that uh, if you do go and do your own research, which we, we highly recommend, you know, we're, we're all about real true facts here. So we encourage our listeners to go out there and do their own research. But discretion is advised because I was terrified. And you know me, I love the spooky stuff. And I actually thought that the Jersey devil was kind of cute. We learned Mm -hmm. quite the opposite, but um, this uh, goat man is not cute. It is actually terrifying. And I would advise against anyone uh, Googling an image of that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big part of what interests me about this week is we're going into it, uh, albeit, you know, I'm a, I'm a little um, uh, unknown in these waters, but uh, the fact that it is something scary and that we have a filmmaker um, is pretty cool. You know, we have a bit of a crossover uh, episode so we can appeal to some of those eggheads out there, you know, who love a camera or, or love to write uh, or creatives in yeah. the past. We've touched on, you know, journalists and folks who have written books and cookbooks and researchers. So this is really a logical step for us, I think. I think it is, too. It's very uh, cool to be able to take that creative approach 
approach to it and maybe connect with it on a, a more of that level because sometimes you can't always connect with a doctor or a scientist. It's like very heady stuff. But uh, yeah, half the time, well, three quarters of the time, Doctor <laughs> Seymour is talking. I'm just, I just, I'm nodding my head and saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I can't yeah. relate. So um, yeah, maybe we can, you know, uh, uh, extend that that bridge. Um, yeah. And uh, speaking of Doctor Seymour, I believe he's with us this week, so we can get a get our classic uh classic and classical uh foundation in science yes because it's very important to root all of our claims in science because otherwise they're not real true facts so let's go ahead and bring in dr seymour today up from the science bunker hi dr seymour hello laura and willie great to have you here again uh this week any news from the science bunker any interesting new experiments coming off of the what turned out to be a the dangerous the b uh, uh b uh, experiment yeah. yeah yeah so we're st- we're still pushing forward with that but we're trying a couple different crossovers here um kind of uh, a couple weeks ago we were talking about mixes of animals you know as we talked about the jersey devil and uh trying to experiment that way in some different ways, maybe some, some bees with, with fewer um, stingers, if you will, uh, to keep myself safe, but maybe a, a more aggressive crossover that we can still have something flying the sky that's going to keep those, those kids, uh, keep those kids in check during the summer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah and that just shows kind of my naivete when it comes to science. I'm like, oh, well, what are you working on this week? And it's, well, it's a process. It's a long process yeah. when it comes to science. It's not just, oh, well, we experimented with this and we're on to the next thing. And I'm excited to see the practicality of something like, hey, you know, bees with a few less stingers so you can examine them uh, you know, in the future. That makes perfect sense. So I want to ask you, Dr. Seymour, since you're here with us today, um, Goat man. Uh, for our listeners who aren't quite aware of what the goat man is, because I was one of those uh, people myself, um, the goat man is a is is really what it sounds like. But the methods that it uses to claim its victims is very interesting to me because the witness accounts have to do with hypnosis, uh, voice mimicry to lure people into a trap, uh, maybe confuse them to either commit their own death. Uh, Other stories say a monster will jump out from the woods. Um, You know, sometimes it has an ax. And so I think maybe that might be a regional thing, but my interest is in that of the mimicry because i know that many animals within the animal kingdom use mimicry as a defense mechanism so i guess i'll i'll start there with you about that um yeah that's very common um both in in predators or in animals we would classically think of predators and um prey um some animals do it as a defense mechanism trying to um mimic a, a more dangerous version of themselves or a more dangerous version of um, a similar species. Um, it's interesting that the goat man, as it were, does that because it's not something that we think of goats doing so much. I don't know. Maybe maybe some listeners get goats and sheep and uh, yaks and all of those things confused. But confusing animals with one another is different than them mimicking one another. Um Sometimes it seems the same, but it is important to note the difference there. Just because you don't know what you're looking at doesn't mean that the um, the animal itself is is attempting to confuse you in that way. So uh, regarding goats, are are those the ones that – had the internet sensation of falling down or what, what, what was that? Wasn't oh, there the fainting um, goats? Yeah. yeah. Or screaming goats. I'm trying to think because I feel like I've heard goats making noises that if I didn't know better, if I weren't watching a YouTube video, I might think, Oh, that's some guy making strange noises. Yes. Goats have had much more than their 15 minutes of fame on the internet. Uh, and that's because, as a species, they do some incredible things. Yes, there is a there is a unique phenomenon where their legs kind of seize up and they faint. But like you said, there, Willie, their scream is not barnyard like. It, it sounds like a person. Yes, it sounds like kind of a 
a, a, yeah, definitely a cross between a person and maybe some sort of large raptor, some sort of like mm -hmm. giant, maybe even dinosaur or huge bird, just like this shrieking scream. No. I, I only know a few things about goats. I briefly worked with some farm animals. Um, I know that they are not predatory animals. They are typically prey animals because of the placement of their eyes uh, on their head because they, they have a very uh, horizontal or this kind of panoramic um, pupil. And I know that serves the purpose of being able to see almost maybe we've got 360 degree uh, is a circle. Their uh, vision is somewhere around 320 degrees, I want to say. So they can almost see completely behind themselves. And that is their number one defense mechanism other than their speed. So because of that, and now that it's mixed with a man, which we know from the episode of Jersey Devil that that uh, species mix animals all the time. We've got ligers, things like that, platypus. Um, if it's mixed with a person, Dr. Seymour, what is the percentage of, of vengeance and being able to use that ability to see almost completely behind them uh, as sort of like a, a hunting, uh, a way to hunt people better? Yeah, that that is incredibly true because um, very few predators ha have adapted that additional that almost as you said 360 degree vision because they they want to just look at just one thing at a time and go for it but once you get that good crossover of a predator prey um you you are always hunting and not just hunting where you're looking you are hunting all around so this this goat man with its um ability to see all around potentially with its um all with the the traits of the goat i mean we think of goats as maybe prey and barnyard animal but they're they are um a garbage disposal in terms of what they can and do eat yes they eat grass yes they eat hay but they also can eat a, a tin can just as easily so to, to to combine that thirst for all of those different foods with the abilities of a human with the omnivoric tendencies of the human we're, we're talking about a potential apex predator jesus so uh, yeah because i keep thinking you know defense mechanisms strong defense mechanisms i mean the only difference between a defense mechanism and an attack is uh what side of the fence you're on yeah right so i mean it, it, all it takes is this um goat man to uh show a little initiative and these strong defense mechanisms turn in turn into offensive mechanisms correct or yes very much so um for example um cat like uh the the tigers lions that we know we think now of as some of the biggest strongest predators and we like to think that maybe house cats evolved from them it, it's the exact opposite. There was a small um, cat-like creature that was an herbivore that was um, prey. And then it initially kind of accidentally got a taste for blood. And then that, that um, desire grew and grew. And when that gets into the DNA of an animal, and when they change the side from predator to prey, there's a whole new um, myriad of abilities that we look at in a new way. And with the large cats, we've just seen how over years that, that can evolve. But that can also happen in isolated instances. And that can also happen in very short periods of time where um, prey can become predator in an astoundingly aggressive and efficient manner. Wow. Wow. This is all, uh, it's, um, harkens to our, you know, what's almost becoming our credo. <laughs> so that, that all makes sense. Uh, it's all falling into place, uh, you know, where, okay, that sounds strange, but there's, there's the science behind it. Yeah. It makes sense because goats are herbivores. They have the ability, all sorts of different things, but they derive their nutrition from, um, 
hay and sprouts and other vegetation. Humans are omnivores. We can eat anything. So if you combine being able to eat anything with literally being able to eat anything, then the goat man really is an apex predator because there's no limitation. So not only is it just killing for fun or it's, it's leaving survivors to tell the tale, but there might also be no trace of its prey. It could just consume the entire thing, which is so scary to me. Yeah, I think about you know just giving a human the ability to the ability, like you said, to eat anything. The 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 outcome of that. It's just I I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it. Just being able to eat anything and not you know die or uh, have an upset stomach or yeah. you know or something like that. Yeah. Um, on that note, is it? Uh, how about we take a, a quick break and come uh, come right back with uh, with our special guest? How does that sound? That sounds great. We will be right back. We're back after our first quick break here on Real True Facts this week discussing the Goat Man. And uh, we have uh, set up a pretty good foundation uh, talking about the, the, the whatnots and could be's of the Goat Man with our resident in house science expert, Dr. Seymour. Yes, and uh, I'm uh, sorry to cut you off there, but we are. Um we're in the heat of it here in the lab, so I'm going to get back to some experimenting and look oh, forward yes. to connecting with you all again soon. By all means. So thank you, Dr. Seymour. We'll close up the science bunker for this week. Let's safely shut that yeah, down. Yeah, safely. That, por- that portcullis is very heavy. All right. And uh, so that brings us to uh, our guest this week. Um, pretty excited, as I, I mentioned before. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, we, we, we have a, uh, I guess I'm going to call it a Real True Facts exclusive guest today. I will be talking to filmmaker Nate Ruger about his horror film, Trust Me, a witness account of the goat man. Um, you know, it, it just came out. It's doing very, very well. So I'm very excited to hear what he has to say and talk more about his process as a filmmaker. So, Nate, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Wow, thanks for coming on, Nate. I um, I want to maybe uh, start with uh, some of the the nerdier aspects. So this was a short film, and uh, the runtime was what around ten minutes? Is that correct? A little over ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes flat plus credits. Okay. So what uh, what was the visual aesthetic you kind of you were going for with this short film? That's a uh, that's a good question. Uh, what occurred to me while I was thinking about this is that uh, trying to uh, the Goatman, as, as you laid the foundation for us, uh, is a figure that kind of captures our our imagination, our fear uh, from a very kind of primal place. Um, and that's what fascinated me about making this movie, because uh, for the longest time, like, we're sitting here having a podcast. We feel like we're at the top of the, the food chain, but there's no one going to knock us off the top. And so there's this idea of a creature that either they could be an apex predator or they can, um, you know, sneak in amongst us without us detecting them, even though we think that we have the best uh, seeing, hearing, or, you know, senses available to us is terrifying. And to try and give that visual feeling with a short film, uh, that was, um, our idea was to kind of flip what you usually see in a horror movie. Most horror movies, when they get very scary, uh, the camera goes nuts. It's flying all over the place. It's a, it looks like an action scene where you're just kind of, uh, flying, moving up and down, uh, lots of movement, lots of cuts. And we decided yeah. to go in the other direction. Uh, yeah, I think aggressive, that by... kind of aggressive, uh, intentional handheld handheld style. Uh, whereas this, as you said, was, um, yeah, it went against that. It didn't force uh, a stylized, you know, shaky cam in, in your face. Yeah, and, and exactly that. And so uh, how we meet the Goatman in this film is just following a couple who's taking a romantic weekend out in the woods, as many of us have done. And while we're with them, we're trying to do a very naturalistic documentary, just kind of over the shoulder, shot, reverse shot. Uh, what we like, what so many of us consume re- regularly when we watch reality TV, just very simple, easy to digest uh, filmmaking that feels natural and organic. And as soon as we start to encounter things with the goat man, and mind you, this is taking place in the woods, 
that's when it starts to get a lot more staged, like something you'd see out of The Shining, something that would be locked off, a very almost like artificially composed shot. And uh, to give you that eerie sense of like, very rarely do you look in the forest and see something that is like symmetrically centered and composed. And so having mm -hmm. images like that after uh, we had just been watching a walk and talk through the woods with a shot reverse shot, and then you're just hanging in this long take that is very centered and composed with little movement just kind of puts you off and that's really kind of i think the feeling that you get with encounter having any of these encounters that come up in these witness accounts that it's it's never like something jumping out of the woods uh and screaming bloody murder at you it's always a sense of like am i too chicken to just go for a hike no no this is nothing this is fine and it's just this lulling of someone who feels like they're at the top of the food chain until they've gone too deep into what they thought was a perfectly safe place. And uh, they're now possibly going to show up on the missing list of another person who went to the woods and never came back. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, before I go any further, I have to ask for all those pixel peepers out there to cover my bases. Uh, what, uh, what kind of camera or cameras did you shoot on? And if you remember your lensing. Uh, yes, we went with uh, uh, the lenses were anamorphic uh, Koa, and um, it was an Ari Alexa that we shot on. And I believe the, the year that we shot, and, uh, gosh, I think it's, it was a few, uh, two or three years ago that we shot. But I remember feeling very proud that we went with that camera because that was the camera used by the majority of the cinematographers uh, who had their films get into Sundance that year, and uh, the majority of the movies that were nominated for Best Picture that year. Uh, mm. at the Oscars. So uh, it is a popular camera because it, it is a, well, uh, we could go off the rails and entirely different conversation about <laughs> this is digital and we're not going to do that. Uh, All right. Right. It is a good digital camera that can approximate a film look while also being lightweight and low light. That's really the most important thing. That we're making was it the, the light. Mini or the Classic? Or I believe you, it was the, the Mini, since we wanted to shift back and forth between handheld for the the daytime scenes, uh, that it wouldn't be you know something that would pull our cinematographer's shoulder off. Yeah, the Classic you know feels like it weighs you know, 15, 20 pounds. Man, that thing is just a, a beast. So the Mini makes sense. And the anamorphic shows, it, it gives that... Uh, that sense of realism in the woods while the, the, the background and the, the bokeh is anamorphic and every once in a while throws, throws you off, you know, in a, in a, almost a vortex. I noticed one of the earlier shots, I thought, Whoa, you know, that background is, uh, the foreground is common or, you know, it's very straight ahead. It looks like it does. And then the background, Oh, well, this is, um, you know, give me a little, um, vertigo. Yeah, yeah, that was something that I thought um, one of my favorite moments of the film. And it's it's not groundbreaking filmmaking, but uh, this is the, the power of the anamorphic lens, which for those of you who are not the most uh, film uh, geek, uh, geeky, uh, it's it's kind of like a a mail slot type uh, lens or format. It's it's much wider than many of the other formats. And uh, if you watch this film uh, online, you'll see black bars uh, above and below. It's a little more widescreen than most. Uh, um, uh, television or movie formats. And uh, because of that, uh, we discovered uh, I had originally conceived a lot of the uh, shots to be um, much more cutty in, in the original kind of like conception of it. And when mm -hmm. we started scouting it with that lens with my cinematographer, she pointed out that like the usual shot reverse shot you'd see in say a, a TV show doesn't really work on an anamorphic lens because there's <laughs> Uh, there's so much space. And so it, even on a hiking trail, like there, there's a very, sorry to come back. There's a very simple shot of their, our two main characters are hiking down the trail. One of them goes ahead and we push into a close up on the other character who's still standing there talking and looking at their phone. And even though we're out in the middle of the wilderness, it feels claustrophobic because with that lens, with that format, if you have a close up, there's two thirds of the frame that is entirely empty. And just we as, as humans, and this also on that lens is starting to drift out of focus, the other two thirds of the lens. So we automatically as humans get this feeling of like, no, 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 you need to be looking up, you need to be looking around, you need to have more space about you. And so that also felt like there's something that was a very natural choice to go with how to convey that experience of 
somehow feeling claustrophobic and paranoid, even though you're in the middle of, you know, the wide open spaces. Yeah, I have to applaud you for that, because watching the movie, there's so many elements to it, which it feels very normal, like it's a very normal thing to do. Um, You know, it's a normal hike in the woods. There's nothing like treacherous about it. It's very uh, simple, something that anybody can do. Um, But the overall uneasy feeling that you're able to achieve uh, with your cinematography was just a great added element to it because we know, I mean, getting into it, we, we already know that something is going to go wrong, but it's hard to, to know what exactly, but the, the feeling of uh, the uneasy feeling that you're able to achieve with the way it's shot. I think that's just a really cool element. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I have to tip my hat to the cinematographer herself, Kelsey Talton. Uh, I met with many, many cinematographers and a lot of came very, very close to pitching uh, that spot. And uh, she, uh, she, she pitched me when I, I originally asked her to just meet for coffee to see if she'd be interested. And uh, her pitch to me, and I'm paraphrasing what she said, but with all the samples she had and everything that she shared with me, it was basically, um, oh gosh, now that I'm, of course, uh, you know, quoted, I'm thinking of the, the cinematographer's name. Who shot with the Coen Brothers? He won his second uh, Oscar for 1917. Um, goodness, but he, he's one of the class cinematographers who really loves to use uh, um, silhouettes and uh, it is a lot of the way he likes to shoot is a lot more sparse and spare than something that is just like going for the juggler or going for the throat. Yeah. Are you speaking of Deacons? Yes, Roger, Roger Deacons. So okay. basically, her yeah. idea was. What if Roger Deacon shot a monster movie? Yeah, and I just said basically like, yes, you're you're my cinematographer. Thank you for doing it. And uh, and it, um, uh, there are a bunch of other little fun facts I can tell about the film. But uh, the, the the greatest challenge with making the film was finding the location. As I'm living in Los Angeles, uh, that uh, looks like it's the middle of cryptid country, but looks like it's not too far from say Skinwater Ranch. Mm-hmm. And uh, those are a little hard to find near uh, in sunny Los Angeles around all the freeways. And, uh, and we eventually found a space. But in that time of searching and searching, uh, and uh, so many other filmmakers, you know, need to uh, pay their rents with taking on other projects, I thought that our little crew might fall apart. Um, but uh, our cinematographer kept dreaming about this little Roger deacons monster movie in between other projects and so by the time we came together and started saying like hey we have the location here's my lookbook here's all of these uh images that i've pulled that i think are good for composition that are good for uh lens lenses and the like she had also pulled a lot of her own material that she'd just been dreaming about and thinking about and really came up with this very polished cohesive look across uh so yeah i i i said why don't we have the camera here and she's the one who made it for us yeah yeah it really shows um the first i believe it's the first interior shot one of the early interior shots of the cabin or that whatever it was that um that deacon's look shows immediately and and uh, my first thought in my head was wow that's a pretty shot it was a good very good looking shot um but I, you know, I could go on about the filmmaking process for another hour or two, and I, I'm probably nerding out and boring Loris. Uh, but I do want to get into some of the, um, well, not some of. I want to get into the the dirt here. As soon as we open, we know, um, as Laura mentioned, something's going on. Something's weird. We see this creature and hear this creature under the blanket. Other, we need to talk about the the audio. And the oh design yeah, the audio too. and and just even the. I, I really implore our listeners to. Um, watch this movie after we're done and we'll tell you where, where you can see it. But uh, just the over the shape of the blanket, cause it looks human, but it, it's not, it could be a pile of something, just the, the color and just the very, very visceral reaction that the characters have to the sound and, and even the smell that conveys uh, very well too. Um, so can you walk us through a little bit what, uh, what your intention was in introducing this element of the goat man? Uh, it makes, to make sure I answer the question correctly, uh, you're speaking about uh, the, the sound element or, or just the introductory scene? 
I I just on a personal note, I want to I, I guess I wanted to give a shout out to all sound design out there. I feel like they're the unsung heroes. So that's that was my intention. But uh, when we see and hear, I guess, both uh, the introduction of the goat man, where did uh, where did that thought process come from? Uh, so that came from uh, I, I remember reading the script and finding it fascinating and originally thinking that this was something that the screenwriter had made up. They had come up with their own original monster. And she pointed me to uh, this uh, popular uh, account that share called Anansi's Goatman. And uh, I thought that that was great. Like, oh, here's a great online internet short story. And she pointed me to, no, that's just the most popular. And, and I fell down a rabbit hole of uh, dozens of stories that span like the past 10, 20 years that are all witness accounts that have been shared online on various forums. And, uh, and then going back even deeper, uh, I, I think the most popular fictional account is the Wendigo uh, by L. John Blackwood. Um, but even if you look at that and go into kind of like the archival notes of that writer um, about that, uh, I think a novella that he wrote, uh, that was based on also kind of witness accounts from that era. And a lot of the similarities between a Nazi's goat man and Wendigo and stories that go back to like, you know, uh, trappers and hunters from the 1800s still remarkably similar. And that's, that was, that's how the film opens is, uh, with telling us exactly what this thing is that we're about to encounter. And, uh, and what I found in my research that the writer and I did uh, about this particular creature, and to be perfectly clear, um, let me take a step back, and because you were talking about the goat man earlier in this episode, and uh, they're very, uh, I'll, I'll try and do this quick because this could be a whole other podcast. Uh, so I know that if you search goat man on Wikipedia, it says, do you mean Kentucky, do you mean Maryland, or do you mean Texas? And I believe, and I'm, I'm overgeneralizing here, uh, that those three are half man, half goat type creatures. And the creature that we specifically wanted to focus on is also called a goat man, but is really seen in its non human form. The, uh, the elements that uh, the goat man that we chose to, to, to highlight in this film is a shape shifting creature. Uh, that the three main elements is that it's known uh, to uh, live in the woods of North America, uh, that it can shape shift. Uh, that actually it's for so uh, a shape shift that it usually is accompanied by an overwhelming smell and that it stalks humans and uh, and there are two other creatures in this specific vein of shape shifting having a strange smell stalking humans that are vaguely similar um, and again I'm generalizing here there's uh, skinwalkers and very little is known uh, about them outside of uh, Native American communities because I believe it is considered uh, forbidden to speak about it with folks who are not within the community. Mm. Um, but I believe, and again, this is all from journals, from white folks who have, so it's dubious whether or not there's any truth to it, that it is believed that uh, skinwalkers are have the same capabilities as humans who have changed into animal creatures and can change back because they have uh, done some forbidden ritual. Um, and we did not want to focus on that with this film. And then there's something called a, a flesh gate, which is very similar to the goat man, except it is known to have a very specific motive of wanting to kill and eat and take the skins of humans. What I found particularly fascinating and disturbing about this particular type of goat man that is known for shapeshifting is that we do not know what it wants. That okay. it very rarely attacks humans. And sorry, I know I'm going off on a No, so that, that was my next question, which you segued beautifully into was, what does it want? Because we've got, uh, you know, this instance of a shapeshifter. We don't necessarily see the form. So what is the purpose of this goat man, um, you know, uh, choosing its victims? Why, why is it doing it? Uh, our, our writer, Leslie O'Neill, who uh, was very brilliant, and she, she was involved in every stage of the production. And so uh, all of the research that she did into the character went into every little thing in my conversations about the sound design, about the composition, about uh, the actor's performances. Uh, so she was kind of overseeing all this throughout every stage of production. And in my conversations with her about this creature, this is a creature that wants to uh, lure and possibly trap people in the woods. And, uh, and there's um, a pretty fascinating uh, video that I remember watching called Fleshgate Encounters. It's about those three types, Fleshgates, Goatmen, 
uh, skinwalkers that uh, go through the five different stages of um, uh, what those encounters are like. And, and what we found also in these hundreds of stories that span centuries uh, uh, is that these creatures uh, usually uh, end up there. They find folks like the couple in the short film and try and perform some kind of mimicry, whether it, usually it's just with a voice or a sound. Like sometimes it's just enough to uh, have overheard something that you said earlier in the day and to say something as simple as, hey, over here, or call your name. And they wait for a moment when the two might be separated. So there would be just enough confusion that you would go in the wrong direction. Uh, and then might even take on the form of your friend to lure you deeper into the woods. And those are the stories. All the stories we have are the folks who came back, who realized, wait, that's something my friend already said earlier that night. They're saying mm -hmm. it exactly word for word in a kind of monotone that would almost be uh, the same way that you might have a parrot uh, or, or something seems off about it, but it doesn't seem fully just like your your best friend, but it's really not easy to notice until you're up close right. and, it might be, and it might be too late at that point. Yeah, and we even have a moment like that in the movie where, I mean, I don't want to give it away, but something very similar to that does happen. Um, can you speak a little bit about these witness accounts that you base the movie off of? Because without those, this would not exist. And so, you know, I believe there has to be some element of of truth to it so which is what we're you know here to prove but um in your research what are some of your uh favorite or, or notable accounts from survivors uh perhaps the most notable one and that i recommend folks check out themselves is anansi's goat man i feel like that kind of uh fulfills all the highlights of the kind of things to you can say what you want about the uh the account style of uh, relating the facts of the incident, however you feel. But uh, buried within that account are all of the uh, moments that I think you can find of what to expect in a goat man encounter. Uh, and I think uh, something that's very hard to convey in a short film, but it uh, is an overwhelming smell that usually smells like blood or rust or very often a, a, like a fresh kill. Um, so, and What's uh, and sometimes, uh, and, and we try to hint at that in this film. But something that uh, I think these accounts uh, share, especially the uh, Nazi Goatman story, is that uh, it's it can strangely become overpowering, that in the sense that if you were to walk toward, walk down a trail and accidentally stumble across an animal carcass, it'll get really smelly, and you just walk away from it. And to some, most of these stories usually encounter, you are sitting in your cabin, you are in somewhere safe, and the smell starts getting stronger as if something is getting closer or something is getting somehow activating this smell to the point of making you gag. Uh, and there's, uh, it, it, to somehow get stronger without moving closer to you, it's, it's strange and, and, and terrifying to me personally. Um, uh, and... Uh, another story that I think I found particularly fascinating to me because it was an outlier, but most of these stories take place in the woods of North America. But this was a story about that took place within the jungles of um, Southeast Asia. And uh, that there's a, someone sharing the story that was, you know, trying to relate it to fellow Americans, that it was like Boy Scouts, except for um, surviving in the jungle when it was an overnight trip to uh, experience what it would be like and to kind of have a um, uh, the more uh, crunchy canola types we call it something like a, a jungle sound bath that you were to go into the middle of the jungle at night and even with your eyes open you wouldn't be able to see anything but you could hear the forest all around you and to do that you clearly need uh, experienced guides to take you in and to hold you by the hand and this particular account uh, they realize that the person who that their guide had at some point been replaced by someone who looked, sounded, and walked just like them, but was leading them deeper and deeper into the woods without um, without taking them anywhere near home. And there were a few kids who did not make it back because they were 
apparently led by the wrong uh, wrong person. Oh, that gave me chills. How did they ultimately find out that it wasn't their guide? What get, maybe gave it away? Uh, what what uh, gave it away was uh, they realized that they uh, th- there was a an, an initial from the best of my memory, an initial uh, discussion of this is what's going to happen. We're going to cross this one river and we're going to go to a certain point and then we're going to walk back across that river. And this one child towards the front noticed that they've crossed a river four times and it's starting to sound different. It's starting to, that like the, the, high, the things that you could sense were starting to change to a point and you could usually hear like the person in front of you, the person behind you. And uh, I think they were told not to use flashlights unless there was an emergency. And I think that was the point at which one of the kids turned on a flashlight and saw that whoever was holding their hand was not someone that they knew. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's wow. terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on that note, I think it's uh, time for a, a quick break. Yes, I think so. I need to uh, compose myself here. Uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back from a short break on Real True Facts. We are talking today with writer-director Nate Ruger about his uh, horror film, Trust Me, a witness account of The Goat Man. It is out now. It's doing very, very well. And uh, we're very happy to have Nate on the show. So let's welcome him back for another round of intense questioning. (laughs) Thank you very much. Uh, Still happy to be here. Yeah. Um, So I want to ask you, because right before the break, we talked about this true story, this eyewitness account where uh, children in the woods were led to believe that their guide was someone that they could trust, but ended up being um, the goat man, uh, I I would imagine. So because your film is called Trust Me, I imagine that you you thought extensively about this, but what would you say is the... um, the most important theme here is it is it trust in the movie because it seems like the goat man is exploiting that and it's it seems like it very much goes after victims and and uses things that they can trust to to convince them to come back in the woods with them uh yes i, I think you uh, uh your question is, is right to the point uh i believe that um it's it's a uh, by titling trust me i think it is in a way uh having the goat man uh Pose the question uh, incorrectly for us that when you hear trust me, you think, should I trust you? Who should I trust? And it's imagining that there is a certain person in this situation that you should be trusting when the question should be flipped around. You should be trusting yourself that uh, especially in encounters with goat men, with uh, shapeshift and cryptids of any kind, they're playing with your sensibility that you are the apex predator, that your senses are the best of any creature in the forest. And that's why you really need to take a step back and trust your own senses. Even if it's just the sixth sense of there's something strange here. I don't know what it is, but I no longer feel safe on this sunny hiking path. We should get in our car and drive home. Even though there seems to be nothing wrong, just that all of a sudden all the birds stop chirping and there's this strange buzzing of flies. That's a good reason to go home. And, uh, and uh, I think something that we tried to explore with this film and that I think a lot of really good horror does is um, really strangely play with this uh, politeness politics that so many humans go through. With. Like, we don't want to be the spoil sport to ruin a nice day of a hike and say, I suddenly feel that I want to go home. That <laughs> yeah. Or spoil an event or a tradition. Um, yeah. That's a very, int- I, again, I'm trying to dance around and not spoil things, but that's a, a very good uh uh, a point in that, um, you know, we always try and be polite. We try not to stomp on what uh, is supposed, the way things are supposed to go, a tradition, a formality, um, instead of, hey, this is unsafe, let's get out of here. It's, oh, well, this is really important to this person, or this is the way it's supposed to go. I, I think I would have serious doubts. Um, I'm trying to think if I was in the in the situation of being in the woods and encountering the goat man, I think it would definitely get me. I, I don't think I would be able to outsmart it just because if I was with someone that I trusted and they appeared to me in this way, I would doubt myself because even if I sensed that something was off, 
I would see it, like if it, if they appeared to me as someone that I trusted, I think even if I felt weird, I'd probably still go with it because it's like, well, what what are the odds that this is not this person? It almost reminds me of as a child, uh, a code word or code phrase, right? Um, if something seemed off, you know, immediately, what's what's the code word? What's the code oh, phrase? Yeah. Like your parents used to say, you know, if if something happened to me, you don't just go with any stranger. They need to know the code word or the code phrase. Yeah. So that it made me immediately made me think of that. You know, you hey, you smell funny, but you're kind of sounding right. You know, yeah. what's our what's our secret code word? Right, right. It was, or it's like they would say, if uh, if an adult that you didn't know was going to pick you up from school, your exactly. parents would have given them the, the code mm-hmm. or, or something, and then you would know that you would be able to trust them. But I guess in this case, you know, there is no code. Exactly. Right. That's why we found this particular goat man, uh, this particular cryptid, among all the different ones in this uh, uh kind of a uh, classification of shape-shifting um, creature that uh, so fascinating to us because uh, it, it breaks that boundary that uh, if you were, it is a creature that can look just like you, walk just like you, you uh, walk right up to your friends and they'll believe it is you because they will have been stalking you the entire day, listening for those code words, listening for things you've already said and you'll be able to say them back exactly word for word, syllable for syllable. And if, and, uh, speaking to what you were saying earlier, I think what we, what makes this so chilling, what makes it so hair raising is because it, uh, if you are to accept that, uh, your choices are either your friend or family member is acting funny or strange, which happens where we, we can be perfectly healthy one day and entirely sick the other, uh, or under the weather, or, or have a strange mood shift, that's perfectly fine for humans. We either accept that as reality, or we have to accept the uncanny, which is like some one thing that we, we don't want to do. We don't want to say, I'm all alone here, and then hear a sound, and then admit that the impossible is now true. Uh, and, and so it is very easy for us to say that, think that that must be my friend coming back out of the woods who probably won't went to go out to chop wood or relieve themselves or something. And instead of thinking, no, they should be back in the cabin behind me. That's clearly a cryptid and I must run for my life because how do you explain that to your friends and family? Sure. So speaking of cryptids, uh, when you're in the conceptual conceptualization phases or pre-production or, or, you know, or maybe you're just saying, Hey, I want to make a movie. Did you explore, you know, other cryptids or did you kind of start, you know, with the, the story and find the right cryptid to fit or, um, or how did that work? Did you look at some, some different, uh, cryptids? Uh, I personally did not. I was very fortunate to come on, uh, and this is uh, another shout out to our, our writer, uh, Leslie O'Neill, that, um, and I recommend this to anyone else who wants to go out and try and make a short film. Uh, I have had many conversations with other filmmakers that are along the lines of, hey, I've got this idea. Do you want to talk about it and see if there's a short in it? And usually that's what the conversation is. It's just talking about whether or not it's a movie, and then we're all very busy people, and uh, me, we're not sure what happens next after that. And uh, she came to me with, here's a script. I've written several drafts of it. I have a producer attached. I have a location in mind. I have the cast already assembled. I have uh, the editor. I have the composer. And she had practically half the production already put together and asked me if I wanted to come on board. And if not, she'd find another director. And, and so I, I had to ask her to pump the brakes so I could take a moment to like throw together a pitch to, to, to see if they would take me on as a director. Right, and, for your uh, side of things. In the fact that it already came to me already so well put together and uh, and well thought out uh, was very attractive to me. And, and that it also, as I had mentioned earlier, was not just something that they threw together as like, here's an idea for a fun movie, that there was a, a wealth of research that went into introducing this figure to, uh, uh, to the world uh, in, in a form of a short film that, uh, like this that we haven't really seen before. Did it ever become scary at times being on set at night, just being so 
entrenched in making this short about the goat man and doing your research and knowing that the woods are dangerous and then suddenly here you are in the woods and you're you're fostering this spirit at any moment during the filmmaking did you did you creep yourself out basically <laughs> Uh, to be perfectly honest, the answer to that is yes. Um, uh, luckily, as a director, you're one of the busiest people on set. And I am not discrediting any other person on set uh, because everyone else is constantly busy, constantly doing something. Uh, um, the, uh, the experience of the director is getting asked a hundred, if not a million questions uh, over a 12-hour period while getting very little sleep. And then having meetings before and after those 12 hours. And uh, so... It was very easy to kind of throw those fears to the background, but to, to get specific about them. When we came there for our location scout, and you can see this on my Instagram and in the film's Instagram, uh, there was a life-size wooden totem that looks like something out of the Blair Witch Project that was oh placed God. at the edge of the woods where most of the business of the film takes place. And we, it was there when we all moved back to make the film. And there was no word from the owners as to who would put it there, where it come from. We still don't know why it was there or what it was doing there. Uh, we knew that we wanted to have a cabin that looked like something that you would imagine characters would go to that would be in the depths of like a real uh, deep, dense, deciduous forest. I thought it looked something like Evil Dead um, uh, cabin or the cabin from Cabin in the Woods. So that we already had. Like we, we did a good job. I think we did a good job with finding a location that looked like it belonged in a horror film. And then just up the road, for those of you who know the movie The Witch, there was a black goat with long horns, much like Black Phillip. And so there are enough little small omens for me to think, I really hope we don't get haunted. Oh, and and, God, and, yeah. and uh, specifically in Anansi's Goat Man story and a handful of other stories, they specifically say, do not say the goat man's name in the woods. And uh, here we are saying the title in between every take. Like, you know, trust me, witness Kenneth Goatman, uh, scene seven, take two, um, in between the other, every other take. And so part of me is thinking, like, please, please don't let us become those filmmakers that are never heard from again. Uh, and luckily, uh, as far as I know, every member of the cast and crew is alive and Chris free. But uh, we're, we're all young. Who knows what will happen to us yeah, speaking of young, I uh, this is uh, maybe a personal note. I may have to cut this out. But did you have any um, – so it sounds like you didn't have any older folks on set. I remember watching Blair Witch with my dad and uh, anything like that that would be in the woods, he would blow out of the water and totally ruin because – he had experience, you know, chopping down trees as a young guy working for the forestry department. So he'd say, look how those trees are lined up. Those are planted. This is this kind of area. This is where they are. Why don't they just fill in the blank? Oh, so, you know, and anytime there's anything in the woods, he's like, well, that way's north, that way's west. And there's this huge generational gap where I'm like, oh, I need a phone to know, you know, how to drink water properly. <laughs> So it sounds like you had mostly young bucks on set. So there weren't any old timers saying, oh, well, we can't shoot this here because that's actually east and face this. That won't make sense if anyone knows what they're talking about. Uh, yeah, I believe that was the case. We did have uh, one of our uh, major contributors stop by the set who was our uh, writer's um, uncle, if I'm getting that right. And, oh, very cool. and so he came on out to just see what he had helped um uh, uh, you know, bring to fruition, and I showed him around uh, a little video village and pointed out everything that every single crew member was doing, and, and, and uh, I, I was very happy to, to help him with that, because it can be kind of fascinating to just kind of, like, break down in real time while they're setting up a shot. This is what the script supervisor is doing. This is what the first AC is doing. This is what the grip is doing. And um, But uh, everyone else was, uh, I believe, in our, in our 20s and 30s uh, making it so and, uh, and there's a lot of very, very helpful apps and uh, software that can help make <laughs> filmmaking easy, such as, like, I didn't know this until uh, this movie is getting made and we were on location, uh, Scout, that there is a, an app that cinematographers can use to chart the course of the sun that they can use, because uh, understandably, especially with very tall trees, you're shooting a daylight scene and uh, you're having an actor uh, do a scene out in daylight and all of a sudden this enormous shadow starts crossing over their face in the middle of uh, a, a take because the sun is moving ever so slowly. 
and yeah, you that's have interesting. to move the camera to chase it. And <laughs> yeah. you have to know where the sun, sun is going to go and set and fall. And you can learn that on your phone rather than cracking open an almanac and crossing your fingers that the sun's path across the mountain hasn't changed in the last 20 years. Yeah, I actually saw that just uh, probably a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, someone charting, uh, this was in the interior of a church, a director DP, and he he charted this, the, you know, the, the sun coming up and coming down because the, the whole wall was windows for this massive, you know, mega church shoot. And I'm like, what am I looking at? And it's like, oh, okay, this is like an astral <laughs> celestial map here. So he knows at this time of the day, this amount of light and, you know, and, and et cetera. And it's just amazing how far we've come and now it's like oh well i'll just use my app for that now i have have to ask you nate um after everything that you've been through and and even these experiences on set where it got kind of eerie and just you know having this superstitious nature of of um you know evoking the spirit of the goat man after this whole process do you believe in the goat man or are you a skeptic uh, I, I cannot be a skeptic at this time. Uh, this is actually, uh, to inject a, a little bit of humor, uh, I believe that if uh, I were to, if this were a scene in a movie right now, and if I were to say no, uh, you would then cut the black and then watch 90 minutes of me being slowly but surely stalked by the dead man and killed. Uh, <laughs> that, that is how most horror movies begin. Someone saying, I don't believe that this creature exists, and so I'm certainly not going to go on record with any sense of skepticism. Like <laughs> Better safe than sorry. Better safe than sorry, but uh, also to be perfectly honest, um, when you take a step into making horror movies, even if it's just you find that there's an interesting character or there's an interesting uh, relationship or visual that you're after, once you start making horror movies, people come out of the woodwork as to why they're horror fans, and you start fearing about their real life experiences, their house, things that happened to them personally, to their friends, uh, like all this research that I did for this one movie, and uh, and hearing the uh, the truth behind all of it, and it makes you kind of get to a place where uh, not that you say that the goat man has to be real, but admitting that like I don't know everything, and if I'm certain, if I'm going hiking with my wife and uh, she's a few steps behind me and I hear her voice in front of me from the woods saying she needs help, I'm turning back and grabbing my real wife's hand, I hope, and running to the car because uh, I'm not going to take two chances. Yeah. I think that's smart. I mean, you got to learn from all that stuff. I think the people that don't learn, they're the ones that fall victim to the goat man because it's like... You know, if you're going to just kind of throw caution to the wind or uh, be cocky about it, I think that those are the ones that he goes after. So if you uh, are smart about it, you're that, that's the best armor. I think that's the best protection from something like the goat man, because shapeshifters are terrifying. Doppelgangers are terrifying. They're very familiar. And like you say in the movie, they just seem like things you can trust, but ultimately you can't. And I think that plays on some very deep um, primal fears that we have as humans. Definitely. And uh, I wanted to throw something earlier that, uh, that I think uh, to tie this all back to the question about uh, sound design that uh, in the very beginning, we're hearing uh, fire uh, flies as we see this thing under a blanket. And uh, that was our best to try, way to try and show uh, through sound this overwhelming smell that you hear about in all of these witness accounts. Yeah. And my favorite theory as to why there's this really strong smell of iron or blood or a fresh kill is that uh, that is the chemical process taking place within this creature for it to shapeshift, for it to go from an animal mm-hmm. to a human or back again, uh, which would, in a way, eerily make sense that you would have this overwhelming smell of blood as it is destroying and remaking its own body in order to try and lure prey. And uh, that just, when I, I think that kind of put all the pieces together for me to, okay, I have to make this move when I came across that, that thought. Uh-huh. So one of the questions, one of my favorite questions to ask after we kind of talk about uh, cryptids or any sort of, you know, something that could pose danger is um, to ask, what should someone do, right? If they find themselves in the woods and they think they might be uh, confronted with um, the goat man, I mean, other than, uh, I mean, just just run or are there any safety measures? Uh, what's 
what are your thoughts on goat man self-defense the uh the first thing that uh the goat man will try to do is to separate is that uh is to go after either to go into a group and yeah it, it'll first try and separate and if not it'll try to uh and this is what's most terrifying about a nazi's goat man uh, account is that if there's a large group of people say like 20 people uh who don't know each other terribly well it'll just jump in as number 21 and it will think that that person is everyone else's friend and will just intermingle without anyone know. Uh, but usually what the building ends up doing is trying to pick people off one by one. And so the best safety measure against uh, this cryptid is that when you go off into the woods of North America to be with people at all times, um, you don't necessarily need to be holding their hand while they, while they go to the bathroom, but to, you know, I will at that point. <laughs> at that point, I'll hold anybody part they need me to. If 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 yeah, I if tether me to the car, the yeah, tether me to the car and one big rope, and then uh, that's just what I'll follow <laughs> to get back. <laughs> so stay in a group, don't separate. Um, uh, what else do you think? Uh, and I think the uh, the warning signs are, and this this can can fail. Is that this is a creature that can mimic, and it doesn't always do it perfectly uh and so very often it is only able to behave in a manner by both saying things and doing things that you have already done for example if it were try to mimic you it would have to have uh seen you sit down or walk in a certain manner and so we would almost be trying to walk in the exact same gait that you have walked or to speak in the exact same with the same mannerisms that you have or say the exact same words that you said so uh if the closest thing you could do is to try and act uh to get to like a a safety word or a, a code phrase is to have them say something they have never said before or certainly not anything in those words and interesting that's the thing we're also human beings are complex creatures like if you say you've never said i love you will you say I love you right now? There may be another reason for them not to say I love you at that exact yeah, moment. Yeah, that is not because it. they're the goat man. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You don't have to tell me twice or you do, frankly, <laughs> I, I'd appreciate it. One time would be enough. So, okay. Uh, look for the warning signs, stay in a group. Um, any other uh, uh, final uh, tips or words of advice before we start to wrap things up? Uh, unfortunately, no. Those are the only ones that, that I can think of, and I <laughs> yeah, think that's a scary thing. Yeah, that's yeah. why this creature is so uh, fascinating and uh, uh, so primarily terrifying. Um, I, I did have one one final thought uh, it, it, that um, uh, I, I think, um, having seen some of the comments that exist online already for this this short film, uh, it. The per, the response to most of it is overwhelmingly positive, but the handful of folks have said things like, this is predictable. And to, to speak back to that, uh, I wanted to point out that most monsters that you see in movies have very similar uh, um, physical characteristics. Uh, like even the creature from It, um, uh, there's usually a, sort of an elongated face, um, something terrifying about the mouth, dark sunken eyes a kind of white or pale complexion. And uh, I think the interesting thing, and, and we started with the scientific outlook uh, for this creature, and I think t looking at things a little bit more scientifically and asking ourselves what is baked into our human DNA uh, that as far back as we can remember, all of our horror stories, all of our nightmares, all of our ghost stories, what have you, that we've been telling ourselves of our campfire since we've been the civilization have those characteristics and the question and the theory that I, I pose to your listeners is that is it possible that that creature that we we live over and over again in our horror movies uh is is itself the goat man is that pale dark sunken eyed shape-shifting creature that seems to be have some version of itself in all of our scary stories wow yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent question to pose, and we'll, we'll definitely open that up to our listeners. Um, I, I want to uh, close out by just kind of singing some of your praises. Um, 
trust me, a witness account of the goat man is out now. And uh, the response has been phenomenal. Uh, semi-finalist women in horror film festival, 2020 best director, short nominee, nightmares film festival, 2019 uh, official selections for monster fest, fear NYC, I horror film fest, uh, NOLA horror film fest, Dances with Films, Crimson Screen, like, holy crap. This thing is kind of all over the place in the best way. And um, I, b- I believe the script was on Bloodlust as well. Am I correct with that? That was uh, another script of mine. Okay. Uh, I, will, I will take credit for it. We'll take it. <laughs> I was just a testament to uh, to your great filmmaking and creativity. But um, So uh, as we wrap up here, why don't you tell our listeners where you can watch Trust Me? Uh, you can find the uh, 10 minute short film, Trust Me, A Witness Kind of a Goat Man, on uh, YouTube. Uh, it's the, as of today, right now, while I'm recording this, uh, it's the first film on uh, Alter, the YouTube channel there. Or you can just as easily go to trustmemovie.com and you can find it under the tab, The Film, and watch it there. Fantastic. And you said the name of that YouTube channel was, is Altered? Alter, uh, A L T E R. As A-L-T-E-R, in, okay. Yes. And uh, they're the uh, the same folks. They, that's their, their horror uh, channel, and they also have a sci-fi channel that is just as uh, fun that I recommend called Dust. Wonderful. And we'll link that uh, on our Instagram, too, and um, in our episode description, you'll be able to find a link where you can watch Trust Me as well for all of our listeners here and around the world. So, uh Nate, thank you so much for coming on today for talking about your movie and the process and just enlightening us about the goat man. Cause you know, we always start out with our, um, our expectations or the things that we wonder about these cryptids, this you know, paranormal, any sort of thing that we talk about, you know, we, we talk to Dr. Seymour, we get our, our science base for it. Uh, but until we talk to our guests, we really have no, um, idea the scope of everything so you've really been able to provide us with some really terrifying details and uh just i think it makes me an even bigger believer of the goat man and i will not be going into the woods anytime soon <laughs> well uh thank you very much it's been a, a pleasure to be here and i think the uh the moral of the story of this film coming out right now is uh staying at home is the best safety measure i agree that's why we're in bunkers Oh, wow. Yeah, we could go into some, some deep allegory there than Goatman being, uh, yeah, social, well, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you mentioned you have an Instagram as well, so um, we'll link that. And then, um, uh, Laura, what is our Instagram and uh, email for people to reach out to us? Our Instagram is Real True Facts Graham. And uh, you can go there anytime. You can follow us, send us a message. Uh, we're always happy to receive your comments, questions, anecdotes. You'll be able to find more information about uh, previous shows. You'll be able to find more information about this show, uh, more info on Nate uh, if you want to give him a follow and a look see, which I highly recommend that you do. Um, and then we also have an email address where you can send us any sort of questions. Uh, send us questions, you might get featured on the show. And we might even do a show about it if we like it. That email address is realtruefactsmail at gmail.com. And uh, we will read your questions on the air. Uh, You can listen to us all sorts of different places. Right, Willie? Yes. uh, Podbean, uh, we're hosted by, so you can check us out there. iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, all of the the heavy hitters. Um, I saw some of the new reviews on iTunes, so please keep those coming. They are appreciated. Uh, Leave us some reviews, some feedback, and share. Please do. Tell your friends. It makes our jobs a whole lot easier when people tune in. And a special thank you to all of our listeners from around the world. We certainly appreciate you coming back this week. Continue to come back. We do a lot of great shows. This is a public service for us. And uh, like I said, we can't do it without you. So uh, I think uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up today, Willie, unless you have anything else that we want to discuss. No, I uh, really solid show this week, and uh, I'm excited to discuss what's uh, on the possible docket yeah. for the upcoming show. Oh, yeah. It'll be a surprise, but uh, you'll be in for a treat. So, listeners, viewers, thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Real True Facts. Keep questioning your world, because just because you hear about it or read about it doesn't mean it's true. We'll see you next time. <laughs>